Welcome back to SF Commons. Tonight we're talking about the 1.6 trillion dollar student debt crisis. We will make a full and complete education a human right in America to which all of our people are entitled. This means making public colleges, universities, and HBCUs tuition free and debt free by tripling the work-study program, expanding Pell Grants, and other financial incentives. Today, we are entering a proposal which will allow every person in this country to get all of the education that they need to live out their dreams because they are Americans. Further, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, it is simply not acceptable that our younger generation, through no fault of their own, will have a lower standard of living than their parents, more debt, lower wages, and less likelihood of owning their own homes. That is why this proposal completely eliminates student debt in this country and ends the absurdity of sentencing an entire generation, the millennial generation, to a lifetime of debt for the crime of doing the right thing, and that is going out and getting a higher education. Ten years ago, <clears throat> the United States government bailed out Wall Street after their greed, their recklessness, and their illegal behavior drove us into the worst recession in modern history. Today, the major Wall Street banks are larger than ever, their profits are soaring, and their CEOs receive huge compensation packages. Our proposal, which costs $2.2 trillion over 10 years, will be fully paid for by a tax on Wall Street speculation similar to what exists in dozens of countries around the world. The American people bailed out Wall Street now it is time for Wall Street to come to the aid of the middle class of this country. We are delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Kevin Kamashiro. Dr. Kamashiro is an internationally recognized expert on educational policy, school reform, teacher preparation, and educational equity and social justice with a wide ranging list of accomplishments and awards as a scholar, educator, leader, and advocate. He is the former Dean at the University of San Francisco and is the award winning author or editor, editor of 10 books. challenge with the student debt crisis is that we um, I think we're maybe asking ourselves the wrong question. You know, there's so much uh, hysteria almost, so much concern over whether this can be, whether we can afford to bail out or to really forgive the debt that is now adding up to 1.6 trillion and affecting about 45 million people. Um, the problem, of course, is that if this were a priority for our nation, our budget would reflect our priorities. And we have funds for all kinds of things, right? We have funds to massively increase our prison complex, to massively increase our war industry. We have funds to bail out the corporations, but we're not actually putting the money where it is most needed, such as in education. Where are our priorities, right, in terms of education? So the Sanders proposal, which is getting the most scrutiny, because it's the most expensive, goes farther than the proposal by some of the other candidates, like Julian Castro and Elizabeth Warren. What he's proposing is that we forgive the debt, um, the 1.6 trillion, and that we also, he goes further, to call for free public higher education. Um, so why this is so important is because, you know, the, the amount of debt, so right now the debt is on average about in the 20-something thousand dollars per person who who's, was at undergraduate level and uh, in the 30,000s for people with a master's degree or in master's programs. Now this doesn't include everyone who's only people who's uh, graduated because a lot of people who are in debt are people who never finished college and one of the big reasons why people don't finish college is because of debt. Um, so it includes this very large percentage of people, right? What we know is that a li little over half the people who begin college finish within one or one and a half times that 
the length of time we expect, which is about six years. And we know that um, about two-thirds of those who graduate are saddled with debt. So what we need to think about is what's the impact on two things, on the individual, their livelihood, as well as on the economy. So we need to think individually and systemically, what's the impact of this debt? And what we know is that debt can be very debilitating, right? Um, well, the number is actually misleading. So we, we're saying that there's a, on average about 20 something thousand dollars per person. But what we know is that in the lifetime of that loan, that amount can be far greater, right? It, it's like taking out a housing loan, right? You can take out a housing loan for a few percentage points of interest in a 30 year fixed mortgage, and when you actually have paid off that entire loan, what's the actual amount you've paid? It can be two or three times the amount that you took out the loan for, right? The interest rate is between 7 and 8 percent compounding. The interest rate is between generally starting at 7 to 8 percent compounding. Right. And then what we know is where the loans become really destructive right. is that if you default on the loan, yeah. these are not fixed rates like housing loans. These loans can like double in percentage rates. So whereas the beginning interest rate is in the single digits, the over time, what we're seeing is that the interest rates are actually increasing to double digits, and the principal, not only is it compounding because of interest, the principal grows because the default rates are so high for student loans. A lot of people are not able to pay back their loans on time, and so what's the two consequences by lenders? One is to increase the interest rate, and the other is to tack on different kinds of penalties, um, th hundreds or even thousands of dollars at a time. So what we see is within a few years, that loan may double in size, but within a decade or two, that loan can increase two, three, four, five times the amount exactly. that it began at, right? And that's what can be so debilitating. And a lot of students, what we know is, yes, they're struggling to repay the loan. What many people don't realize is a lot of the private loans, you actually begin the repayment while you're still a student. And this is one of the reasons why people can't often finish college. There's no way that they can repay the loan while they're trying to get their degree. The, the impact of this is that it's it's not only harming individual livelihood, it's actually weakening the ability of our higher education systems to positively transform the lives of students. And so the younger generation now tells me how tough things are. Give me a break. No, no. I have no empathy for it. Give me a break. Because here's the deal, guys. Well, economists are saying that if the federal government just forgives all the student loans, it would actually help the economy. I think Sanders' proposal is going to help the economy in two really big ways, right? One is the forgiveness of loans, and the other is the waiving of tuition at public higher education. Mm -hmm. So the forgiving, sort of the clearing of the debt is going to be very, very important because it allows people to be far more um, active in the economy, right? Yeah. If you're not saddled with debt, you're going to be able to contribute to the economy much more positively. And yeah. we know that debt has all kinds of debilitating consequences. It affects not just me, it affects my family. Family, it affects those I'm caring for, it affects those I have to turn to for financial assistance, right? So the rippling effect is going to be quite significant. Yeah. But I think it's also important to think even bigger picture, that when we think about making higher education less of a commodity where those who have the resources can afford it, and more of a public good and a human right, yeah. what we then see is that the the higher education system becomes to function much less like a sorting machine and much more like a great equalizer, which is what many would argue education should be about, right? If education were really accessible um, to many, many more people, it's going to be able to serve a, sort of a democratizing function in society. Right now, you know, the most elite institutions are attended by those who are most able to afford to attend and have and they're often ones who were attending far more high performing schools to begin with because of income and um, and resources so higher education sort of perpetuates this those who have can get more what we actually need to be doing is thinking well, about like higher she, education like Felicity Huffman. yes right a great example tip though of a majorly problematic iceberg right yeah it's this part of this whole big scandal right the operation blues scandal where a lot of celebrities wealthy people are bribing universities or play in intermediaries to be able to get their kids into these top institutions. But, you know, there's several books actually that have been written recently right. that make the case that there are so many ways that the elite game the system. Bribing is really the tip of a much larger iceberg. And not only are 
sort of admissions under scrutiny these days. But, you know, when we think even about financial aid and what makes education more accessible, one of the things we want to think about is how, you know, um, a little over half a century ago, the vast majority of people were getting need-based financial aid. What was, mm-hmm. first of all, tuition was a fraction of what they what it is now in colleges across the country. But when people needed financial aid, it was primarily through grants and scholarships. Right. That percentage of the financial need that's met by grants and scholarships is now a fraction of what it used to be at the same time that tuition is skyrocketing. So what is making up this gap between the skyrocketing tuition and a dwindling pool of kind of grants and scholarships, it's loans. And so what we've seen is in the past 20 years, the um, student debt uh, 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 kind of cumulatively has doubled in size. And at the same time, by the way, past 20 years, what we've seen is that at many, many institutions, the percentage of the operating budget has actually been cut in half in terms of what comes from public funds. So we're disinvesting in uh, colleges at the same time that tuition now has to make up the difference right, right. and and there's not a bigger pool for financial aid so obviously what's stepping in is um, is loans exactly and the loans are with the US government the US government is holding majority of the loans right so it's a big split, right? We have two kinds of financial uh, right. of student loans. We have the federal student loans, the guaranteed right. student loans, um, and then we have a growing body of private loans. Okay. And both, unfortunately, are vastly underregulated. Um, it's very easy, for example, for a lender to tack on all kinds of penalties, right. to jack up your interest rates, right? Um, but what we know is that the because the default rate is so high, yeah. And, be, and therefore, you can jack up the penalties and the interest rates. And because there's no bankruptcy protection. Joe Biden is trying to appeal to younger voters as he's expected to launch his bid for the presidency really any day now. Uh, but as a senator from Delaware, a corporate tax haven where the financial industry is one of the state's largest employers, Biden was one of the key proponents of the 2005 legislation that's now bearing down on student loan debt, which prevents the $150 billion worth of private student loan debt from being discharged, rescheduled, or renegotiated as other debt can be in bankruptcy court. Steve Malsberg joins us from New York now for this story. Uh, Steve, many young voters, they they don't even realize that Joe Biden played a key role in the financial industry's four-decade campaign to eliminate bankruptcy protections for student debtors. Uh, So how do these students, you know, how do we get this word out, basically, that Biden helped create the current crisis that this country's facing? Isn't that stunning? Like, why in the world would you propose that? So, right, so for these two reasons, right, the ability to manipulate funds and the lack of protections, there's more reason for people to kind of game the system, and that's why we're seeing so much fraud in the student loan industry. Okay, so what's going on with laws is pretty much any other kind of loan out there, right. you can discharge in the case of bankruptcy. Um, but student loans and there are probably all kinds of reasons why people oppose this, but student loans is one of the few exceptions to this. So you declare bankruptcy, student loans persist, which means that um, lenders can come after things that would normally be to support um, cases of hardship, unemployment, social security, and even hardship loans in the case of like hurricane destruction. Like all of those things can be tapped into to pay off student loans. And why this is so appalling, why we as a nation should be so appalled is that it's, is when we ask ourselves, who's getting the student loans? The student loans are primarily being absorbed by, are being taken out by the students who struggle the most economically, right? Right. It's the people who cannot afford. Exactly. And they're the ones being frauded, uh, facing fraud by lenders. They're the ones being saddled with rates of increasing principles that that are unparalleled in the loan industry, right? right? right. No other kind of kinds of loans are we tacking on all these, um, all these uh, penalties. Exactly, the rippling effect is quite stunning, right? Right. It destroys your credit history, it destroys your livelihood, it destroys your kind of employment opportunities. It is quite destructive, and people are really taking advantage of this fact, and education, which should be giving you a leg up, is now becoming a major, major barrier. Well, I mean, let's talk about who it impacts. It's not just the students, because, 
a lot of parents co-sign for their kids. So when a kid graduates and they cannot get a good paying job, then they cannot afford, so then the, the bill collectors go after them and garnishment of their wages. Or if their parents co-sign for them for their loan, then the parents who are elderly people getting garnished. Even Social Security gets garnished for student loans. It's true. It's true. There are so many sources of funds that are being tapped. Budget freeze years ago, the liberals of my party said, it's an awful thing you're doing, Joe. You are all the programs we care about. You're freezing them. Money for the blind, the disabled, education, and so on. And my argument then is the one I make now, which is the strongest, most compelling reason to be for this, but this amendment or an amendment. And that is that if we don't do that, all the things I care most about are going to be gone. I mean, whatever happened to that old conservative discipline about paying for what you spend? I'm up for re-election this year, and I'm going to remind everybody what I did at home, which is going to cost me politically. I, when I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant veterans benefits. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Somebody has to tell me in here how we're going to do this hard work without dealing with any of those as Danny indicated, what I did is a number of years ago formed a caucus in the Senate called the Defending Social Security Caucus. And what we said, it will be over our dead bodies if you cut Social Security for seniors and the disabled. And, and what we did is to work with senior organizations all over the country, the National Committee to Defend Social Security and Medicare, the AARP, other senior groups. We brought in millions of names in petitions, and we ended up beating back the effort to cut Social Security. But that's only a partial victory, because the goal should not be just to defeat efforts to cut Social Security. The goal should be to expand benefits for people who desperately need them. So how do you do that? Well, it's not hard to do. First of all, anyone who tells you that Social Security is going broke is not telling you the truth. Social Security has a trust fund of $2.7 trillion, can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 19 years, OK? Now, 19 years means that we're not in a crisis but it does mean that we should act as soon as possible. What do we do? What's the solution? Who tells me? Who wants to tell me? All right, what does that mean in English? We want to make uh, Social Security payments uh, paid by people who earn more than a very small amount of money. Right, okay. The economic theory that's driving so much of current day policies is still informed by this kind of trickle-down Reaganomics, that we right. put our money at the top and we assume that that's going to help everyone else. Whereas what we know from history and from research is that it's a really bottom-up e economic reform. It's the New Deal way of thinking right, about things, right. right? The New Deal wasn't about um, enabling the corporate elite and the banks. It was actually about providing massive amounts of new employment, infrastructure, social security, net, kind of the, social, the net of social services. It was about enabling the individual at the massive levels, right? Massive amounts of individuals to see greater livelihood. And that's what's going to build an economy. That's what's going to build a nation. So I think that's what we need to be thinking about. It's not this kind of top-down reforms, but right. bottom-up. And one other thing I would say about the Sanders proposal is, so what he's actually proposed is that, uh, is that part of the, you know, so t Sanders wants to greatly increase the tax on the very, very wealthy and the corporations. The, the very wealthy are so undertaxed, as we know, right? The corporations, the very wealthy, are so undertaxed. There's so many loopholes. Amazon oh. uh, made a profit of, what, $12.1 billion in 2018 and paying zero. Isn't that amazing? Zero tax. How wrong is that? Like, if it's not even about increasing their tax. It's about saying they need to be fairly taxed. And if, exactly. if corporations and the very wealthy were fairly taxed, there would be so much money. 500 companies are not paying 
We that have paid is appalling. Right. We should be appalled by that. And, and a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot of wealthy, wealthy corporations and individuals who are putting trillions of dollars in tax havens in the Cayman Islands and in Panama. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the person who did the expose, the journalist, was, she was murdered. Right. And, and we can understand why, right? Because now right. people are exposing the secrets. So if we were to think about really diving into the Sanders proposal, one thing that I would point out is, so Sanders is also talking about Medicare for all, right? He's right. talking about um, all these really proposals that those on, in the middle and on the political right are saying, oh, these are too socialist. But let me actually bring as a parallel healthcare because healthcare is an interesting debate where we're talking about, oh, this is sounding like socialized medicine. And Medicare for all is actually um, making public the health insurance system what it actually doesn't make public or socialize is the health care, the much larger health care system. Right. Right? We're not talking about doctors becoming government employees or hospitals run by the government. So when you talk about making public the health care um, insurance system, you're actually right. talking about kind of socializing a very small part of the much larger problem. If you really want to talk about making health care a public industry and a public good, right. you would actually socialize healthcare and same with higher education. We're actually tinkering with, it's just like insurance, it's talking about creating a system that differently talks about access and finance, mm -hmm. but you're actually still, it's access to the same problematic system. It's really a small step into what the massive transformation needs to be, which is really democratizing education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yes, it is going to be expensive, and yes, it is a move to making part of the public education system more public, just like part of the healthcare system more public. But really, we're not tackling the much larger problem, and that's what needs to come next. That if we are to think about fairness, and if right. we're to think about our, the collective, right, not just about individual success, but what does it mean to be healthy as a country or as right. a community, then we are thinking about what's the role that everyone needs to be playing. Right. Um, and I think that's another problem with, I think, so many of these conversations, is it gets reduced to individual consumer choice right. and choice of freedom, a freedom of choice, rather than talking about collective responsibility, collective ownership in the problem, right? right. thinking about how we as a society or a community are going to come together. So thinking broadly about kind of public health care or public education, right. thinking broadly about fair taxing, right. uh, those actually are some of the really bigger questions we need to be grappling with. Yeah, and you know, one of the historical developments that I think is really important as we think about sort of how, how the economy serves the interests of the elite right. is, you know, so throughout the 20th century, there were several really powerful social movements. Right. These social movements that really pushed the economy to operate differently, right? You had kind of, um, kind of left populism and new labor that really fueled the, um, the development of the New Deal. You had the civil rights movement and the war on poverty that were really kind of also rattling right. how the economy worked. But beginning soon after the civil rights movement, you saw the formation of the, um, the conservative revolution, right? You saw the, the formation of things like the business roundtable, the philanthropy roundtable, this is the early 1970s, that looked at the gains legislatively of the civil rights movement. And they began to ask, how do we organize so that actually laws and policies can be passed that benefit the corporate elite and the business right. sector. And so what you see is the, the formation of this network of organizations, policy think tanks, advocacy groups, philanthropies, media organizations, lobbyists, that are all about trying to work strategically and in the long term to change policy to really fuel the development of a very corporate-centered economy. Right. And it's not surprising then that we're kind of reaching the pinnacle of that, where so much of what happens at the policy level really is not about the common good. It's not about the working poor. It's actually about making the elite even more elite, even exactly. you know, serving the even top 0.1% of the 1%, right? Um, and so I think what we need to ask ourselves is, again, not how to blame individuals, but how do we return to thinking about the power of social movements to redefine what we want to be as a the society. Government has a pe for the people, it has yeah, to work for the people. It has to work for the people, and I think the people need to s see hope that social movements can actually change things. They have in the past, they can again in the future, and they are right now, right? Social movements are changing how we think about the climate. They're d redefining that debate, um, and I think it has to happen with the economy.
economy, it has to happen with education as well. And I think part of that revolution is also about drawing connections between different um, social institutions. So, you know, you can't, so bringing up housing, for example, there are many who have argued that you can't actually fix the problem of segregation in schools, right? Okay. Our schools are more segregated in many places in this country than before oh, really? desegregation began. Yeah, we've actually totally reversed track and gotten how, worse. How is that so? So, what, well, so just, I'll, let me, I'll say how it's so, but just to finish my, my reference yeah, point, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you can't address school segregation unless you address housing segregation right, because right, right you, we assign students to schools based on where they live and our neighborhoods have become more segregated. So why schools have become more segregated over time is Brown versus Board of Education 1954, right? right. The court said segregation illegal. Right. But we didn't actually begin to desegregate schools until around the, the mid-1960s and that's right. when the federal government began to tie compliance with non-discrimination law to federal funding. So for about 25 years, we, we were desegregating schools, and the most progress was made for um, African-American students in the South. But throughout the 1980s, the attacks on um, desegregation began to build, and what we saw was that a lot of the court-ordered desegregation programs were expiring. Right. So by the end of the 1980s, we reached a point where scholars began calling that era the re-segregation period. As the desegregation programs ended, right. we returned to what we've always used to assign students to schools, which is residence. And given that residence is becoming, it had been becoming increasingly segregated and still is, it's not surprising that over time, it's not going to go back to where it used to be. It's going to go back, it's going to go even worse than where it used to be, right? right? So fixing segregation, busing and desegregation programs were always a Band-Aid solution. If you need, if you want to tackle segregation, you actually have to tackle the root cause, which right. is segregated um, re uh, residences and neighborhoods. Right, right? Right, right. And I think that that's... Now, Bernie Sanders talk about the Green New Deal. So when I was talking about linking education segregation with housing segregation, Exactly. That's exactly, I think, the thinking behind the Green New Deal. So the brilliance behind the Green New Deal, one of the many brilliant things behind the Green New Deal, is that it does see the intersection between a healthy planet with so many other things, right? And this is really informed in large part by works like Naomi Klein's book, um, right. This Changes Everything, where she makes the argument that the rhetoric around climate destruction is the blaming of the individual consumer. We drive too many cars, we turn on too many lights, we, right, we burn too much fuel. But the reality is that it's kind of um, uh, capitalism, that's uh, the U.S. capitalism that's driving climate destruction. And so if you don't change the economy, if you don't change how things work in terms of agribusiness, in terms of transportation, in terms of all these other things, you're actually not going to get at the root. You know, things that we see common across right. Sanders' proposals is not simply enabling and empowering individual consumers. What he's trying to do is look structurally and intersectionally at the problems, and that's what we need to be doing. Green New Deal is a great choice. It doesn't simply say everyone needs to drive less. It says let's look structurally at the economy and let's look intersectionally at how the environment has to do with all these other the sectors right. and that's how you're going to fix the problem same with education we need to look not at individual performance and even individual financial aid we need to look at the, how the system is broken and how it intersects with other systems and that's how we're going to improve education the student debt crisis has helped the recruitment to the military as we fall into debt it's not only the people who are poor it's that you cannot finish college Right? right, so there are many reasons why people are now looking for other alternatives to yeah, livelihood. There's no other yeah. option. You know, when I think about unable to live up to its promise of being the great equalizer, right? It, it really has served very effectively at sorting students. One of the things that, you know, Thomas Jefferson once said is that the, the dream, the vision for public education in this country is where every child can walk to their neighborhood public school and get the very best that our nation has to offer. He was actually arguing that everyone should get the very best that our nation has to offer. And I think that's what we should be thinking about. What's a system where everyone wins, not where some win and some lose? And I think that's the direction we need to move in. And I'm hopeful that the proposals being put forward by folks like Sanders um, gives us the opening volley in that move. Thank you for joining us again. See you next time. Good night.